Welcome to Washington Policy Center, Washington Policies On The Go, our continuing monthly virtual series of events. Um, it's also a podcast, um, so we do upload the audio on podcasts uh, for those of you who find it interesting and want to share it with your friends. We'd encourage you to share um, that uh, that material on your social media accounts and, and uh, with friends. Um, and we also upload it to YouTube um, as soon as it's available. So today we have a really packed show. We have uh, Mark Harmsworth, uh, our small business director, who'll be talking with us about some of the new state regulations that are coming down, creating a de facto vaccine passport uh, for employees. And we'll talk uh, about related issues in terms of reopening Washington and getting us back to work. And then we'll talk with Todd Meyer about, uh, Todd Meyer is our Center for the Environment Director. He's also the author of EcoFads and um, he's just um, an environmental expert, I think, you know, without parallel in Washington State. Um, he's just been fantastic at bringing forward uh, data, in some cases um, on, other, on issues unrelated to the environment as well. Uh, and he's really been fantastic about examining um, the, the data that's been brought forward and whether or not an environmental policy is actually helping the environment and whether it's doing so efficiently. And that'll be the main topic of our conversation today. Here's the way it's gonna work. What we're gonna do is uh, I'm going to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with our small business director, Mark Harmsworth first, and then I'll follow that up with a one-on-one -on -one with uh, Todd Myers, our Center for the Environment Director. At any point in this conversation, if you have a question, I'd encourage you to enter it into the uh, question function of Zoom, not the chat function, but the question function, if you could. Um, but you know, if, if you have to, if you're confused by that, go ahead and use chat and we'll try and get to those as, as well. But the Q&A icon looks like two little bubbles. It's either on the right-hand side of your screen or maybe at the bottom of your screen, depending on how you're viewing this. And if you enter your question in there, we'll try and incorporate it in um, during the Q&A section or at any point uh, during the interview. So it'll probably be about 10 or 15 minutes for uh, each individual. And then we'll open it up to questions where both uh, our Center for Small Business Director, Mark Harmsworth, and our Center for the Environment Director, uh, Todd Myers, will be um, answering your questions. We really do want, we try to get to all of them. And if we don't get to all of them, we make sure you get the answers later. So again, feel free to ask any question and, and ask it at, at any time there. Uh, right now, I'd like to bring forward Mark Harmsworth, our Center for Small Business Director, uh, Mark, as always, you know, thanks for making your making the time. Um, you know, your uh, last series of blogs ha have um, gained a, a quite a bit of, of attention on radio and in, and in other publications um, because of the idea that Washington State is creating a de facto uh, vaccine passport. Why don't you uh, lay the groundwork? Tell us about the regulations that were brought forward and and why you're you're calling it a vaccine passport. Well, thanks for hosting today, David. Um, yeah, it, it's a really difficult uh, situation that LNI has placed many of our small business and, even, and some of our larger business, obviously, as well. And uh, effectively, what they're doing, and for those of you who don't know, LNI is labor and industries. If you're a small business owner, you know exactly who LNI is because they call you on a frequent basis. I hope not. But uh, what they're doing basically is coming in and saying, look, we want to know before you remove masks from your employees. We want to know what the vaccination status is of your employees. Now, the employer-employee relationship, to be clear, an employer has the ability or has the, you know, they can ask an employee what their vaccination status is. So if they may say to their employee, hey, are you vaccinated or not? Ellen is telling us that we need to find out before you can take your mask off and just operate normally in the business space, that's okay. That is not a HIPAA violation. That's not, um, it gets a little gray with the American Disabilities Act, but it's not a violation. Where the problem comes is when the employer has to store that information and then give that to LNI, because what LNI is requiring is a written assertion from the employee that the employer stores that they want to inspect to make sure that the employer is following the rules that LNI has come up with uh, for uh, operating a business. And that's where we get into a gray water. In fact, L and I themselves said that places employers in dangerous waters because I don't think they want to admit that this is definitely uh, verging on uh, potential HIPAA or ADA violations. And the reason for that is, and it gets really complex, but it's to do with covered entities and business associates under the HIPAA Privacy Act. Now, so far, we've not heard anything out of L and I or uh, any other government agency refuting this. 
So we're assuming that this is the problem that they've put our employers in. And it's a very difficult situation. Now, this is the part where I'll need you to slow down because uh, when I was reading through the blogs, I had to, I had to read and reread this because it's part of the kind of uh, legal definition of terms here. When you say covered entity, you know, what, what does that mean? What are, what are we really talking about here and how, to, how is that defined? Yeah, so if you are a covered entity under the um, HIPAA Act, which is the Privacy Act, the Federal Privacy Act, what that means is that you are an organization that collects medical information and stores it, and you have certain responsibilities and um, restrictions on how you use that data and how you store that data to keep it safe. So you can't just collect everyone's medical information and then start sharing it with the latest marketing fad company that you're working with to, to do those types of things. You, you just can't do that. It's very restricted. And there are certain penalties that happen if you have a data breach, if you release that to somebody you shouldn't have done. LNI is a covered entity because it collects medical information. Many businesses are not, although there is an argument to be said that if you have a health plan with your, your employer and they're collecting information from you, then technically they are, but they're not subject to the HIPAA rules as we do normally. Now, if you're a broker or you're a hospital or you're somebody like that, you are a covered entity under HIPAA because you're as part of your function collecting that data. What are the fines? I mean, um, if the state forces someone to do something, does that give the business a get out of jail free card when it comes to the possibility of the federal fine? Or does it put both the business and the state at risk of, of being fined or, or uh, getting in trouble based on these laws? Do you, do you know how that works, Mark? Yeah. So the, the, the there's sort of two levels to this. Um, if an employer, uh, let's say you as an employee tell your employer, I, I decline to uh, tell you my vaccination status. That's a personal piece of information that you don't need to know. I'm not going to tell you where I'm at. And then the employer then, and, and I'm going to say, I don't give you consent to share that status, whether it's positive, negative, or decline with any other body or agency or other company. If that employer then shares that data, yeah, they've potentially violated your your HIPAA when they share that with the, the, sec, the, the second agency in this case, because it's a covenant entity. That's where it gets really, really gray. So the fines will come from the HIPAA Act for basically a data breach at that point, if they can show that. And really, l has placed our employers in a very difficult situation. Plus, on top of that, if they refuse to answer, l can technically fine the employer for not following the rules. So they're between a rock and a hard place. Yeah, that was, that was actually my, my next question is, you know, based on my understanding from you is um, the businesses right now are at this precipice where if they don't do this, they can get fined by LNI, but if they do do it, they could be in violation of uh, federal law. And my understanding is that there are significant financial penalties for violating uh, medical privacy, or at least potentially significant penalties. It's like, yeah. you know, I'm from the radio business where if you break certain rules on radio, potentially you could pay out a lot of money, even personally, if you break certain rules on, on air. And same thing with these, uh, with these laws. Um, and yet it sounds like the Department of Labor and Industries in the state hasn't hasn't addressed your concerns or, um, or made any move uh, to clarify with the federal government or oh, I don't know who they clarify it with, but they, they got to get legal clarification to be clear that they're not encouraging Washington state employers uh, to put themselves at risk. Right. So you're in a situation right now where they've created this new rule, which actually requires a fair amount of work for an employer to set up. I can pretty much guarantee there's a bunch of employers out there that don't even know they're supposed to be having a process to collect this information. You got two, 300 employees. It's going to take a while for you to collect all this information. So has Ellen and I got a grace period while you're collecting this information before what happens there? Then when they show up, there's no clear definition of what's a violation, what would be a, a warning letter. And I haven't heard yet of anyone having a fine assessed against them as an employer. And so, you know, I think when that happens, that's when you'll start seeing folks that have been affected and the potentially even lawsuits. If the if the assessment of the HIPAA and the ADA, don't forget the American Disabilities Act, which prevents an employer from asking any additional questions about your medical status, that puts you in jeopardy there. And what's what's the stated purpose? Why gather the info? Well, I can't really determine the uh, the reasons why the 
the governor's office wants to collect this information, but I suspect it's because they want to continue to force mask mandates on us. They can't do it from a individual perspective, but they can do it through an employer. It's the same thing, the same type of leverage they've been using for keeping our restaurants and retail establishments closed at 50% under the threat of losing your business license, your liquor license, or what other licenses you have to get from the state just to operate a business, which is grossly unfair in many cases. But that's what they're doing is trying to force a, a, a particular view of masks onto, uh, onto Washington State. I mean, yesterday when I was reading, the federal government had uh, the tweet congratulating Washington State as being, you know, um, what I think, number 15 or 13. And as far as uh, be, being 70 uh, percent vaccinated and then our state kind of tripping over itself to say, no, 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 wait, we're not 70 percent because the federal government counts everybody 18 and over. Washington State wants to count people 16 and over. And so there's a difference there. Plus, uh, they're using uh, the previous census data, whereas we're using updated data from, you know, some other state department. <laughs> and I just thought we're really going out of our way to make sure that we don't open up right now. I mean, it's the, the, the stated goal was that if Washington State from the governor was if we reach 70% early, we just open up. And the federal government saying that we have, and it, you know, as I was reading that, I thought, well, then why, you know, what is the point of gathering this other information or requiring this information to be gathered from other employers um, if you've achieved your vaccination rate goal and uh, people would be able to go about without, without you know, masks and social distancing anyway. I mean, I, it's one of these things where maybe somebody had an idea where this might have been handy a year ago, but I'm, I'm not really, I'm, I'm just wondering if you see something that I don't or if I'm missing something about about the government's action here. Um, well, let, let me uh, address one little thing on the uh, difference between the federal and the state issue. The And this is quite interesting that they don't want to reveal this information. But the VA's office is not telling the state the vaccination status of its veterans. So veterans are going in, they're being vaccinated, um, and the VA is not telling the state. Um, because I suspect, for the same reason you've just described, they're afraid that they're going to violate some kind of ADA or HIPAA rule by telling LNI. So just to talk about that. But the second thing is, uh, the governor indicated that after June 30th, masks would still be required for those that have, have not been vaccinated. So I suspect that's why they're collecting this information is to continue that enforcement after June 30th. Everything will be open. Our capacity restrictions will be gone. And if you're not vaccinated, then um, this is the way they're going to try and enforce you to do it through your workplace. Now, restaurants, it's still an honor system. Retailers, it's an honor system. So you can go in and out. And if you've been vaccinated, you know, they're asking you to you can say you can remove your mask. And if you're not vaccinated, you can take you can leave it back on. But uh, very different in the workplace. They can use the, the Damocles sword of the L and I to cut off the employer's head, quite literally, if they don't do what L and I says in triplicate. All right, Mark, I'm sure we'll be getting to a number of uh, questions for you coming up, um, and, and we'll do that during the Q&A section. Uh, thank you. I'm going to bring forward uh, Todd Myers, our Center for the Environment Director, to talk a little bit about new environmental policies and uh, if you are a, um, a regular observer of and reader of our blog, you'll see that uh, Todd has uh, put forward that the combination of a number of our policies leads to corruption and graft that uh, our, um, our latest efforts at improving the environment um, are, doing, uh, are doing so at uh, an unnecessary expensive with unnecessary controversy and with minimal uh, environmental impact. And I thought it was, it's a very powerful work and I thought we should have him on to uh, talk about uh, that. Todd, um, let's see, let's, let's uh, turn on your video if, if, you've, uh, if, you, if you don't have it. Todd, what, what is the, um, the least effective new environmental policy um, or what's the biggest mistake Washington State has made in environmental policy uh, based, I, I suppose, on the, on the last legislative session? Uh, so first, I noted that the mayor of Snohomish has joined us, which is great because uh, the city of Snohomish has the best beekeeping place in the entire state, the Snohomish Bee Company. So I hope he appreciates it because it's fantastic. Um, as for the legislature, 
Um, <clears throat> let me just sort of quickly, I think most people know uh, what happened, but let me just give a quick overview. The two key bills that were passed in the session were one, what's called cap and trade, um, which basically sets a, a cap on how much CO2 emissions the total state or covered companies can emit. And then it goes down basically to zero by the year 2050. It's very aggressive. We have to meet very aggressive targets by the year 2030. Um, the targets are based on meeting an entirely unattainable temperature goal, um, but it's politically popular and um, everybody has convinced themselves that we need to meet it. So we have that. The second uh, piece of legislation is the low carbon fuel standard, which requires companies um, or um, uh, oil companies to reduce the carbon intensity of fuels by 10% basically over 10 years. Um, and then it goes above that if we meet in certain, certain targets. The problem with this is, is that when you combine those two pieces of legislation, the low carbon fuel standard does literally nothing uh, because all of the reductions that you're going to get are covered already in the cap and trade. It would sort of be like somebody asking you to donate to help the homeless and buy food for the homeless. And then you say, okay, so what if I don't? And they said, oh, that's okay. The government will make up whatever you don't do. Uh, well, then you say, well, why am I doing this, right? I'm just wasting my money. It's good. The goal is going to be met whether I give you my money or not. Uh, that's exactly what the low carbon fuel standard does uh, when it has a cap and trade. But biofuel companies spent a lot of money uh, lobbying over the last few years. Um, it was a policy that was favored by the chair of the House Environment Committee, um, and he wanted to pass it. Um, he failed year after year, so he passed it. Um, so now we get to spend an incredible amount of money for absolutely no environmental gain, which is very frustrating. Uh, but it's sort of the way we do things in Washington State, which is as much as we say that climate change is a crisis, we spend a lot of money to do very little, but uh, do a lot of signaling, virtue signaling on the issue. And you made the same point about salmon, not to, not to divert us off to a different topic, but you, you had a specific blog or an op-ed uh, detailing how, how salmon for all the talk and all the attention uh, that were given to orcas and the and the problem with um, the lack of salmon for the orca um, and the need to save the salmon, despite you know numerous increases in state revenue coming in, salmon hover near the bottom, and the the large public focus from politicians is on um, on big ticket items that cost enormous amounts of money for very little benefit to the fish. So. You've established a pattern there, I think. Safe. Yeah. So, I mean, when uh, a couple of summers ago we saw um, the orca mother carry her baby, and everybody wanted to help the orca, which I agree with. We right there, the southern resident killer whales are an endangered species, and we want and the way to help them is to give them more food. Basically, they're starving to death. We need to get yeah. them more chinook. Um, so we need to recover salmon in a variety of ways. Um, so there was a lot of talk about how salmon were a priority and everything, uh, and a lot of the funding for those projects come in the capital budget. In the last capital budget, salmon projects represented about 3.4% of total spending. So not, not a lot, significant amount of money, but not a ton. This year, those projects got a 7% increase in funding. So that was good. But the capital budget overall increased spending by 24%. So as a priority, it actually fell behind. It's now below 3% of the total capital budget. So it's fine to say that we don't need to spend as much or other things like that. But if you're going to say salmon are a priority, salmon and orca are a priority for us, and then you spend money on lots of other things instead, it's not a priority. There's lots of things that we can do to make the money we spend go farther. And there was legislation that actually reduced some of the red tape. We need to do a lot more of that because we need to make the dollars that we have go to fish, not to bureaucracy. But at a fundamental level, if you're not prioritizing salmon recovery, you shouldn't go out in public and talk about how important it is to you. And that's where we are right now. Politicians talk a lot about how important salmon and orca are, but they're not backing it up. Now I know um, I know one of the things that you like to focus on is environmental improvement, and you know what we tend to do is focus on waste, and we talk about you know how much money something costs. Uh, but for people maybe who you know are not following the issues all that closely, maybe they interpret that as well. All you're caring about is money or the bottom line instead of about the environment. 
And one of the cases that, that you've made is a lot of our environmental policy, you know, indeed you've, you've just made some of those points uh, here, but, um, but particularly as it pertains to climate, um, mu much of our environmental policy isn't actually designed to get the biggest bang for the buck. In other words, you know, there's a, there, it's designed for headlines and symbolism rather than actual um, improvements in the goals, in the, in the stated goals. Would you say that's a fair assessment of, of um, our latest programs and, and expenses? And then I do want to deal with the expenses because money does matter and it takes, there's an opportunity cost to it where, you know, people feel the pain, they're expecting a certain benefit, you know, what kind of a benefit are they getting uh, and what kind of a pain will they be receiving? Right. So with regard to cap and trade, which is sort of the main climate policy we now have in Washington state, California has had it. Uh, other places have had it for a while. Um, my critique is um, not that it won't be effective. There are a lot of policies like the low carbon fuel standard, like solar subsidies, like EV chargers, where the money we spend yields almost nothing. That's not true with cap and trade. Cap and trade, it has a hard cap. We will meet that cap as long as they enforce it. The problem is, is that it's, it, it's very inflexible and what happens in Washington state is, is that as you get fluctuations in our CO2 emissions year to year based on a variety of things like snowpack, the number can skyrocket or crash. Um, so it's, that's the problem is, is that it's very inconsistent. It could, do, it could do harm to the economy. It's not well suited to Washington state. The other problem is um, that the targets that we set are so aggressive that, it's gonna, that the price is gonna skyrocket. Um, very rapidly. So we may meet those targets, but the targets are inappropriate. Um, in fact, uh, Bill Nordhaus, who won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2018 for his work on climate economics, says that the goals that are in Washington state law of either two degrees Celsius or 1.5 degrees Celsius, he says 1.5 degrees Celsius. He just he doesn't even calculate the cost of it. He just says it's infeasible. We can't even do it. And he says two degrees Celsius is a, you actually spend ten you spend ten dollars for every dollar of environmental benefit that you get because they're so aggressive. That's the problem. If you want to cut CO2 emissions, I can tell you how to do it. Ban cars tomorrow. It would work but it would be unbelievably expensive. That's the problem with cap and trade. Not that it won't work, but that it's ridiculously expensive and causes more harm than good. Describe more about what you mean by, um, by setting the goals too high. Um, because I think people hearing that, you know, for the first time uh, might be reacting saying, well, wait a second, our environmental goals have been too low. I mean, we've, we've, we haven't actually achieved what we wanted to, how can this guy, um, how can this organization step forward and say these, the, the goals are too high? I thought you're supposed to shoot for higher goals. And that way, if you don't achieve it, at least you've achieved something. I mean, what's wrong with you? So uh, walk us through what you're thinking there and, and what you mean by that. So there is a, a friend of mine who works on salmon recovery. And one of his favorite things to quote is uh, JFK talking about why we needed to go to the moon. And he says, you know, we, we do this not because it is easy, but because it is hard. And the thing I point out is that's true. But he said we should go to the moon, not Pluto. So what you need to do is to set your goals appropriately, goals that are attainable and goals that yield more benefit than they cost. Like I said, we could meet our CO2 reduction goals very rapidly by banning cars tomorrow, but we would never do that because the cost associated with doing that would be so destructive for so many people that it doesn't make any sense. The policies that we have, although they are more opaque than that <laughs> intentionally, uh, because politicians don't want people to see the cost, um, they are also much more expensive than the benefit you get. Rather than spending $10 to get $1 worth of CO2 reduction, why not spend $10 and get $10 worth of CO2 reduction? It, waste of waste of resources is waste of opportunities to help the environment. And I think that's the problem. You can't just say, hey, it's only money. Don't you care? Yes, I care because we don't have a lot of money and we need to make sure that every dollar is spent well. And I think that's the, that's the problem I have with 
the lack of funding for salmon is, is that people claim to care, but they're not putting the money there. They get distracted with all sorts of other trendy, cool things and waste money where it doesn't have an impact rather than where it would. Um, and speaking of money, I, I do want to get to how um, how financially the new environmental policies, you know, uh, and the combinations of them will impact people. Because as you say, just like you know, there's limited amounts of resources in, in government. Oftentimes, there's even more limited uh, resources among households, and um, and I'm seeing a lot of increase in fuel costs, um, or at least driving costs in the horizon. Not necessarily identified as a tax, because as you say, it, you know, this isn't structured necessarily like a like a gas tax would be, and there's a huge opportunity cost to it because while uh, since at least well since Gary Locke, um, Governor Locke. Washington State has been talking about our decline and our declining infrastructure, um, our bridges in disrepair and other things. So there's a huge opportunity cost when we collect a lot of money related to transportation and then that money, or at least we, um, whether we collect it or at least we, we create a cost to it, if it's not used for um, the infrastructure that is around our transportation system, the opportunity cost is there's no way you can get that money. I mean, it's, it's just gone and you're not gonna be able to repair those things. So walk us through those costs and what, what households can expect to pay for these very limited benefits. So the first thing is, is that when the governor signed the low carbon fuel standard, he commented that, the, that it doesn't increase gas prices. I think there is no other way to put it than the, to say that that is simply a lie. Um, both California and the state of Oregon, who, which have low carbon fuel standards, very clearly say it increases gas prices. The state of Oregon actually has a web page where it says, here's how much the low carbon fuel standard adds to the cost of a gallon of gas year by year, because the standards get more strict and the prices go up. And so for 2020, the data they just released said it costs more than three cents. It adds more than three cents a gallon and they're only a quarter of the way to full implementation. So it'll be 12 cents or more uh, when it is fully implemented. So it, it is bizarre the number of times people in the environmental community simply say, oh no, it doesn't, it doesn't cost anything more. It, it is clearly just nonsense. It's just pure nonsense. And everybody who has one admits it. I don't mean, I understand politically you want to say, oh, you know, it's not that much or that it's, it's hard to say that it costs increased costs of gasoline. But why not say, yeah, it's going to cost a little bit more, but it's worth it. They don't even make that argument. They just simply are dishonest about the price. So given the, the numbers in California or given the numbers in California and Oregon, the low carbon fuel standard, which is set to take effect in 2023, will add one to two cents a gallon in the first year. The cap and trade bill is much more expensive based on the uh, documents, the financial documents that were part of the bill in the legislature, it will add 18 cents a gallon in 2023. So in 2023, the, com the combination of the cap and trade and the low carbon fuel standard will be about 20 cents a gallon um, to, uh, in 2023. Both of them go up steeply from there, so that they will get over 50 cents a gallon by 2030. Cap and trade also impacts home heating and some electricity. We don't have a lot of carbon from electricity, but our estimates are that it costs between $300 and $400 per household in Washington state for a household with two cars. Um, that's how much it will cost in the first year um, in additional taxes on energy and gasoline. Have you calculated how much it costs in 2030 for that household? Because that the first year at 300 and some odd dollars to think, all right, $300 over the course of the year, I can suck that up, but maybe. Um, <laughs> but when you, it starts getting really scary to me when you start figuring out what it's going to look like by 2030, which isn't that far away. I mean, you know, it used to seem like far away, but it's not. Um, yeah. So that's it. The estimates for the cap and trade is, is that the price would at least double and probably more than that based on the um, fiscal report that, uh, that was attached to the bill. Those are the minimums, though. I mean, based on what we've seen elsewhere is, is that the price goes up rapidly. And as I said, the 2030 goal in the cap and trade bill is extremely aggressive. 
So what you're going to see is prices go up. So it would go, those numbers would at least double um, based on both what we're seeing with the low carbon fuel standard elsewhere and the fiscal note that goes with cap and trade. So when you talk about the increase in costs uh, per gallon, where does that money go? When, you, you know, right now, when you go to the pump, people know Washington State has pretty high uh, gas taxes, they pay those taxes, and they're assuming that those go to the highways and, you know, for, for upkeep. Where are these, where are the, I mean, they're not, some of them aren't necessarily considered taxes. Where do these costs, where does the cost from the consumer go when they're paying this extra at the pump? Because it won't show up as a tax. Um, it'll just be an expense. And in some ways, a nebulous kind of, wow, price of gas is way up. I wonder what happened. Right. Yeah, so. so the low carbon fuel standard, the money never goes to the state. The state simply confirms that gas and oil companies have purchased credits from biofuel and other companies. So all of the money goes to biofuel and other companies, which is why the biofuel company spent so much <laughs> lobbying for it. Uh, what was interesting, getting back to the, the price issue, is, is that one of the lobbyists for one of the biofuel companies, a company called Neste, which is based in Finland, one of their local lobbyists claimed that there were no price increases. And the irony is, is that Neste in California was virtually at the same time arguing that price limits should be removed in California so that the prices could continue to go up. So in California, they wanted to, they were demanding that the prices go up, even as here they were lobbying, telling the legislature that they wouldn't. So the money for the low carbon fuel standard simply goes to the biofuel and other companies creating credits. There's also an interesting aspect of that, which is Amazon, which is already committed to a zero emissions fleet um, actually now can sell the zero emissions work that it is doing as credits in that market. So it is now going to get paid by taxpayers in Washington state to do what they said they would already do. That's sort of how ridiculous this game becomes. I think it's great that Amazon is doing those things voluntarily and meeting those goals. Um, but I don't think that we should pay them for doing what they already said they should do. The, um, uh, what was the, oh, uh, with regard to cap and trade, the money that increases the gas taxes does not go into the gas fund. It is not what's called 18th Amendment protected. It doesn't go to build roads. It goes into a long list of sort of special interest projects um, um, that's allocated to different organizations. There is a social and environmental justice panel that oversees um, how the money is spent. A certain percentage is, is dedicated to tribes. Um, so there's a long list of groups in there that get payoffs. The roads are not one of them. <laughs> so this was why initially the bill was tied to passing a transportation package. There was a, um, a, a section in there that said that it wouldn't be enforced until a transportation package was adopted with an additional gas tax increase to go to roads. The governor illegally vetoed that because it's a subsection. You can only veto a section, not a subsection, um, breaking that promise. So um, if there was hope that this could lead to some um, spending on roads to reduce congestion and other things, that was eliminated by the governor. So, you know, for a lot of, um, you hear you know, the cap and trade plus a low carbon fuel standard. And for some people that whose primary concern is, is being green, uh, being more environmentally aware um, and focused and action oriented, they hear that and think double the benefit. It's like a double mint gum commercial, you know, it's, 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 it's double everything, it's fantastic. Um, but I, I've heard you point out that it, it doesn't work that way with this environmental policy that really the one policy negates the other, and there's one that's providing a, a certain amount of benefit, and the other is just sunk costs. So could you describe how that works and why, you know, having a two-pronged approach is, is really um, counterproductive in this case? Yeah. So again, what the cap and trade does is says, if you are emitting, if you're a company that is covered and emit CO2, you have to meet this target. And to some extent, it says, we don't care how you meet that target, um, but just do it one way or another. You can either do it by on your own by reducing your CO2 emissions, or you can buy credits from somebody else. That's a fairly standard market mechanism. It, it actually, um, it's the system that was used to redu reduce acid rain. 
Um, so people don't like cap and trade, understandably for a lot of reasons because of increased costs, but compared to the alternatives, it's actually a better system and it is um, a market-based system as long as you set the targets right, which is the problem that we haven't. Adding other elements that though, is sort of like saying here, I want you to meet this target. I don't care how you do it, but you have to do a certain percentage of it in a way that helps my friends. <laughs> well, now you're not getting any additional environmental benefit. You're just spending money to help friends. And the analogy that I used in one of the pieces that I wrote is like, if somebody said to you, you know, hey, do you wanna help the homeless and buy 10 meals for them? It's great. It's like, okay, great. You have to buy them from my brother and he's gonna charge you $100 a meal. It's like, well, wait a minute. Right? All you're doing is helping your brother. That's not helping the homeless, right? What I would say is, well, obviously you don't care about the homeless. Right? That's what we get from the environmental communities when we say, well, wait a minute, you're wasting money on things that, that add nothing and cost a lot. And they say, well, clearly you don't care about the climate. No, what I, I care about the climate, what I don't like is the waste. What I don't like is wasting opportunity to do good by throwing money away. That's what a lot of it, that's not just the low carbon fuel standard, that's subsidies for electric vehicles, that's subsidies for solar, all of those sorts of things throw money at something that needs to be done anyway but that are particularly expensive and pay off political special interests. It's like policy litter. You know, they, they have the, um, uh, they're claiming it's environmental policy, but, but there's a lot of leftover wrappers in it. And they're just leaving it strewn about everywhere and not caring about it. As we drive down the road of, public, of climate policy, there's a lot of trash on the sides. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. A lot of that uh, extra plastic webbing uh, attaching itself to various people try, trying to breathe and, and make actual progress. I know we haven't touched on uh, market-based reforms, which I know is near and dear to your heart when it comes to the environment. I'm sure we'll have an opportunity to do that during the Q&A section. But we are at that point now where I like to turn to audience questions and encourage you to uh, put your question in at any time in the Q&A uh, um, tool uh, for Zoom. It's got the two little conversation bubbles and a Q&A uh, symbol there, easy to find and then enter your question for Mark Harmsworth, our Center for Small Business Director, who I'll bring forward again now, and, uh, and or uh, Todd Myers, our um, Center for the Environment Director here at Washington Policy Center. I'd also encourage all of you to check out the Washington Policy Center blog on a regular basis. Each center director brings forward some great information and fascinating information in an extremely timely manner on the blog, and, uh, and we bring it to you when you need it and, and when you can act on it. Um, and if you believe in free markets in Washington state and you think free market approaches and common sense approaches like this are of value, I'd encourage you to become a member of Washington Policy Center. Uh, be a part of Washington Policy Center. You don't have to sit on the sidelines. You can join us. You can get your um, email uh, newsletter from us every Friday. Uh, we've got some great publications for you and, uh, and we survive because uh, we have uh, supporters around the state who believe in what we do on behalf of free markets in Washington state. So I hope you'll consider becoming a member. We'll put a link in the chat function so that uh, you can join easily Washington Policy Center. First question um, is from uh, in, an attendee who says um, that they have a couple of employees who've already told them they believe that asking them for vaccination information is a violation of their personal rights and the employees will not tell the employer. The, the employer then writes, I did ask all 50 plus employees to voluntarily let me know if they'd been vaccinated, but only about 20% responded. I've chosen not to ask and list all employees vaccination status. Can you tell me what risk I might be facing by not complying? Mark. Well, uh, it's a, and that's a question that I've been asked a lot in the last week. Um, so putting your employer hat on, and we're talking about liability here, if you start discriminating against, discriminating against your employees for vaccine, non-vaccine, then you're putting yourself, as Ellen and I said, in dangerous waters because, you know, the ADA uh, folks can come after you for discriminating against your employees. The l &I rules require an employer to have a written assestation from the employee that they've been vaccinated before they can take their masks off. If they don't supply that to you, technically under the LNI rules, they are required to continue wearing their masks and following the six foot guidelines that were put in place last year. 
So just from a liability perspective, it get you you're really on shaky ground because L and I can come after you because you don't have the process in place, you don't have the records they're asking for. Um, but you're also breaking the ethical trust and the employee's right. They don't have to respond. You as an employer, you can ask the question, but the employee uh, doesn't have to respond. And so uh, if they want a written assertion, I'd suggest you have a form that says vaccinated, non-vaccinated and chooses not to respond because that's where it's at. So curious, Mark, uh, just to follow up and, and maybe you don't know the answer to this, but I recall there was a, um, a gym owner in Washington state who was fined massively by LNI and they won against LNI because they pointed out they, they did what was required to keep employees and customers safe. So why are they getting picked on anyway? Um, I'm wondering if something like that might not apply in these circumstances as well. I mean, I've, I've seen some, there was some, a study that came out from, um, I think it was MIT researchers uh, recently where they were pointing out that the six foot rule, for example, wasn't necessarily going, it wasn't, it, that, that wasn't the essential rule anymore. Um, so science has changed as they've learned more about the, uh, about, uh, the virus and um, government policy, on the other hand, hasn't changed nearly as rapidly. So I'm wondering, you know, would that be a kind of defense or they're just looking at too many legal bills to, to make such a case anyway? Well, I think you've sort of hit the nail on the head. In that particular case, that gym owner uh, was fined around $40,000 and appealed. What he did was reopen um, when gyms were supposed to be closed. Right. And um, Al and I came in and said, you can't open. And the, and, the, and the owner said, hey, look, I'm following all the guidelines. I'm open, but I'm following the guidelines. He appealed and the fine was was overturned by the appeals board because, and this is the crux of the answer to the question, um, is... Uh, he was operating safely. So I think if Al and I came in, wanted to see this process and you were operating safely, it would be very difficult for them to find you and make that stick. Again, I'm not a lawyer and you should definitely read the L and I rules because they have a, a strange way of enforcing things that nobody really understands, but uh, that would seem to make sense. Next question is for Todd. Um, I understand your assertion is it's too expensive to try to limit carbon emissions, especially from cars. Are you saying we should therefore do nothing to curb carbon emissions? If this is not true, what is your plan to curb carbon emissions and cut down on air pollution? It is not in fact my assertion that it is too expensive to limit CO2 emissions. And in fact, uh, the governor in December uh, claimed that he had heard no alternatives to his plan uh, to reduce CO2 emissions. Um, we pointed out that that's nonsense, that we have uh, offered a number of different things. And so uh, on our blog in December, um, I sent him a letter and sent it certified to make sure that he would see it so that he could never again say that he didn't hear other uh, ideas. And the idea is that there is already a market for projects that reduce CO2 emissions that is um, very effective and very low cost. We could meet, we, will, we are going to miss the 2020 targets that the state has set for CO2 reductions. We could have met that if instead of spending money on solar subsidies and other things like that, we had invested it in projects that reduce CO2 emissions um, that are currently available on the market. We could have met it. We decided not to because um, what is more important is policy that is politically beneficial to certain interest groups. So that's what we have advocated. The other thing is, is that I, um, what we have seen with so many environmental policies, and this is especially true in climate policy, is that when the state fails or when King County fails, King County, for instance, has a, has a 2020 target through 2018, which are the most recent data available, they've only reached 4% of the reductions that they've promised. So they're gonna miss it also. So relying on politicians to live up to their promises or be held accountable for their failure I think is a fool's error. So one of the things that we have talked about are opportunities for individuals to take action uh, without having to wait for politicians to do it because that is not working. So for instance, I am carbon neutral. I invest in projects that uh, so that I actually, um, the emit, CO2 that I emit is reduced elsewhere. So I'm carbon neutral. Uh, more people could do those sorts of things for very affordable costs. They'd be more effective than the political things that we're doing right now. 
So I think that there is a combination of things that we can do at the government level to use markets, which are already doing good things, and at the individual level so that we don't have to rely on politicians to live up to their promises, which they invariably don't. Mark, next question's for you. Which federal agency can provide clarity on these gray areas? Is it that agency which would impose the fines? Um, well, it's going to be uh, the, I don't know the, the exact name of the federal agency uh, for, H, for HIPAA, excuse me, um, but it would be that agency is responsible for that and the enforcement arm of that. So um, it, it's going to come down to uh, uh, commerce is my guess would be the agency that comes after you on the HIPAA violations for the, the costs on that. So um, the LNI guidance, um, I've posted the link in the chat window here. And I think someone just did it as well. Um, that gives you the, the guidance that LNI has come up with for this and how they uh, plan on applying this and potentially fining you. Next question is for Todd. If the governor's veto of the subsection was illegal, why doesn't somebody challenge it? It is being challenged. So yes, uh, this isn't the first time that he's done this where he's illegally vetoed a subsection. Um, and those have been challenged. And I think actually today, uh, the Supreme Court is hearing a challenge to his previous um, illegal subsection veto. So I anticipate that this will be challenged. Um, the Speaker of the House, um, Democratic Speaker of the House has said that she will challenge it. So uh, we will see that. Um, there is an interesting side note to that, which is the section that uh, required uh, an increase in gas taxes and funding for roads before the cap and trade and low carbon fuel standard policies would be implemented was part of what was called a grand bargain to try to get votes for those two very expensive bills by allowing there to be funding for transportation. Uh, it was announced and we were asked about it um, immediately saying, what do you think of this? And within 30 minutes, we said, well, it's, the governor's just gonna veto the subsection. Even though it's illegal, he's done it before. Um, uh, uh, several folks in the environmental community and other legislators got very angry at us for saying that, saying the, the grand bargain was just phony. Um, so I made a bet with one of those environmental activists saying, all right, if you think that we're wrong, then let's bet, we'll see what happens. And that was, that was uh, I think two months ago now <laughs> that we predicted that. And when the governor came around to the day of signing, guess what he did? Exactly what we said he would do. So uh, the good news is that a charity uh, is $50 richer because of my bet. The bad news is that we now have to go through this silly legal process to show the governor once again that what he's done is illegal. I've never seen a reaction like we saw uh, from um, the national tribal leadership, by the way, about the governor's veto. Yeah, um, that, then, that was on a that was on a different section. Yeah. That was on the tribal consultation section, um, and the problem there is, is that he at least signaled to them that he agreed with it, or never told them that he disagreed with it. They didn't find out that he did until the day that he vetoed it. So they they felt betrayed, understandably. Whether you agree with the policy or not, the, uh, the, the level of tribal consultation, and I think that I think there's some merit to saying that we shouldn't allow tribes to veto projects, but you should at least make it clear to the people you're collaborating with that we don't agree with this policy and we're gonna veto it. And he apparently did not do that, which led to the reaction that you're talking about. Next question is for Mark. As an employee, how do I fight back against government mandated employer, employer vaccination passports in Washington state? Is there some lawsuit or lobby group I can donate to? Is WPC or some other organization taking money on the issue? Um, so uh, we've heard that potentially there, there is an organization, uh, the Freedom Foundation is maybe considering filing a lawsuit on this. Um, well, you've not seen anything filed yet, but how you can fight back is know your rights, know that you don't have to disclose your personal private health information to government agencies unless it's part of the function that they're providing for you and that they've, they've gone through that, that HIPAA certification. You know, my small business, if I deal with medical information, I have to be certified to deal with that information every year. So, you know, an, an agency or something like that that hasn't gone through that, you don't have to share that information with them, particularly if it's nothing to do with them. I mean, really, vaccination status for an employee is now LNI's purview. I mean, really? What's wrong with this picture here? Um, and then with your employer, be if you're an employee, be uh, courteous, be respectful. The employer has to ask you as, you, as you've heard, 
um, and that is not an illegal question, your response can be, yes, I'm vaccinated if you want to share that or you're not vaccinated. And if you don't want to share it, just say, you know, I declined to answer that question. There's nothing they can do at that point. Um, and, the re- and the employer has to record that for L&I under the current rules until someone actually sues on behalf of the employers the rulemaking from l and I think you'll find, just like we did with the contract tracing that started to come out last year and the backlash that happened against that, that enough people shouted and screamed about it. And that's the other thing you can do, write to your representatives and let them know what you think about it. Um, enough people shout and scream, then the government will back off because they know that they're on shaky ground. And, and again, just as they said, dangerous waters. If they're admitting this, then they know that this is not a Roy Schneider jaw situation for them. They don't want to get into the water. Next question is for Todd, but Mark, you might weigh in on a variation of it. Um, Question is, what have been obstacles to communicating better climate and salmon solutions to legislators to make better choices, Todd? Uh, I think the fundamental problem with a lot of environmental policy is that that politicians are not held accountable for not living up to their promises. Um, And so it's not a matter of communicating. They they know. what the, that salmon projects need more funding. Um, and in many cases, they know that low carbon fuel standards and things like that are very expensive ways to do things. But when your reward structure is that you get rewarded for doing high profile trendy things, but not for missing the targets that you've set, then you're gonna keep doing high profile trendy things and keep missing the targets. Like I said, King County in 2018 was only 4% of the way toward the target they said they were going to meet for CO2 reductions in 2020. There is, e- even with COVID, there is no way they are meeting that. Will anybody write about that? Will, will the media cover that? Will the King County executive be held accountable, um, either in the media or at the ballot box, for badly missing that target? The answer is no. And how do I know? Because when they announced in 2020, the new plan for the next decade, the University of Washington Climate Impacts Group, which claims to care about reducing CO2 emissions effectively, was part of the press conference talking about what a wonderful job they were doing without ever having looked at how badly they had failed in the past. So as long as people don't, people, even scientists, even people who purport to be scientists, treat promises and words uh, as more important than outcomes and actions, we're gonna keep getting bad, ridiculous policies, which is why every time a politician talks about how we are facing a climate crisis and then wastes money spent on solar subsidies in Western Washington, um, uh, it's the reason I drink. It's interesting um, that, uh, you know, among the things you point out is there's also a media component to that and that I find frustrating, particularly from a media background where, you know, as, as you've pointed out, you've got a, a, a pattern of goals being announced, big headlines and rewards given in the media because, you know, uh, um, for a, for a We're politician. We're a leader. We're yeah. showing leadership. Right, right. And there's a glowing headline, you know, eliminations within by 2050, these, these things are gone or, you know, by 2020, and then um, slowly but surely the obviousness of failure st- sets in on a policy side, they erase those things, and then they announce something new and they get the reward all over again. And um, this doesn't just happen in environmental policy, which is why, Mark, I thought you might want to weigh in as well in some of the challenges of kind of breaking through um, what I would describe as, as a media bias. I mean, I think most people in the media try to do a good job, not all, but um, but most try to do a good job. But uh, there are many people who who um, are adamantly uh, who adamantly refuse to acknowledge the bias of their own uh, uh, political or worldviews and how it uh, impacts their their work in these fields. So you know, in in your view. Um, you know, what's, what's the best way to get around that? Or, if, or in your experience, what has been your, you know, your uh, most successful way of, of working with 
uh, with what we have in terms of traditional media. Yeah, there, there is some sort of taking the, the sign from a legislator's perspective. Uh, there's an immense pressure on the legislators to do what um, the other legislators are doing. So you, you end up with a powerful lobby group that's um, lobbying an environmental issue, and three or four legislators are on board with this. That's what they believe, and that's the grid that they're looking through in, the, in their lives. There's an immense amount of pressure put on the other legislators that may not support it or really don't care, but they have to go along with their caucus. And so that's how a lot of this stuff, back to that question around um, uh, obstacles, that is some of the obstacles. It's that tr- that horse trading that happens down there in the legislature. On, on, the, um, on the media side of things, what I've discovered is it's a symbiont relationship often between lawmakers and, and the media. You know, the media is looking for a story. They're looking to to get the clicks. They're looking to get those eyeballs on the page and that kind of stuff. And if it's a legitimate story, that's great. But they're also looking and the, and the legislation needs to understand that when they're not working with the media, they're not, those stories are not being fed. And so the media is now looking to create those links and those eyeball looks. And so when the legislator is talking um, or anyone's talking from a news perspective to the media, um, yeah, there's there like you said, there's there's always a, a a a desire, I think, sometimes to have the story go in one particular direction. I've been interviewed several times where I didn't say the right thing, and the interview never even saw the light of day. Had I made the little sound bite that that got me on the TV or got me on the radio um, because I made this little sound bite, they would have done it, but they didn't because they had that bias and they had a, an intended, um, and like you said. Uh, many, many of the media are honest and they're, and they're trying to report the news as unbiasedly as they can. But there are some that definitely have an agenda and they're hooked in with those legislators that are making those decisions and putting pressure on others. Um, and they report the story in that favorable light. I mean, I've seen it many, many times. The good ones, and they know who they are, they're the ones that report the news as it really happens and will actually take a step back and understand their own bias when they're looking at things. Well, I'll give it. I'll give an example of that. The Seattle Times just had a great piece about the youth homelessness project in King oh, County, yeah. in Seattle, talking about the complete failure of that project. It was fantastic reporting. It was they did a lot of work to uncover what was going on and show how it failed and how badly it failed. My first thought was it would be wonderful if somebody did that for King County's CO2 and Seattle CO2 emissions projects. There's a lot to find there, but nobody has yet. Yeah, that was a fascinating piece for people who missed it. Um, you know, they announced an end to youth homelessness. And there's about a thousand youth homeless that they were dealing with. And despite all kinds of, you know, celebrity interest, business interests, um, multiple agencies involved, and all kinds of new money involved, I mean, millions of millions of dollars. Um, what happened was they never really got the program started. It just kind of, they got the headlines. And then like Homer Simpson in the classic meme, they just kind of fade into the bushes and go away. It's uh, it's a heartbreaking story, um, and also you you know a, a political mess um, to read about the times. That was a great story, a not so great story though. Todd was uh, one recently. I think it was ABC News that, that did a story on the dams, and they asked you about it, and you pointed out that the um, that the environmental groups that their story about the you know nearly extinct salmon and the Snake River run, um, that the environmental groups that they were quoting were cherry picking data and you showed how they were doing it and how if you used more up-to-date data, it was actually one of the best salmon runs. Um, and so they, you know, to their credit, they did quote you and, and talk to you, but they didn't change their story. The entire story is still based on the premise of the data that was cher- cherry picked. That had to be frustrating. Yeah, so the group, the National Organization of American Rivers listed the Snake River as the most endangered river in the country. And my reaction to that is, if the Snake River is the most endangered river in the country, we're doing better than I thought. Uh, Because while there are certainly problems on the Snake River, there are problems all across the Northwest and all across the country, and the snake is no worse. The the particular statistic that people use is, is that spring Chinook salmon populations are very low. And what they say is is that we're on the edge of extinction. In fact, they quoted a PowerPoint presentation by some advocates of destroying the dams, saying that the population um, is at the edge of extinction. And in fact, 
Um, the run was likely to be smaller this year than it was last year. And within five years, 80% of the runs um, on streams above the lower Granite Dam, which is the farthest up, would be essentially extinct. I pointed out that this was nonsense, that they were not using the most recent data and that we were in a cycle. And the irony is, is that at the minute that that story came out, not only were runs not lower than they had been last year, they were 70% higher than they were uh, at the same time last year. We are 10 days away from the end of the spring Chinook run. Spring, the run is 45% higher than last year. So the, the ridiculous thing is, is that the minute that story came out about how the salmon run was dying, we were having a better run than last year and a much better run than two years ago. And the, the cycle was again, moving into a good phase because of ocean conditions. So yeah, I was actually pretty pleased that ABC News quoted me at length in their online version, but they didn't include me in the video. And as you say, they stuck with the general theme of the story. Um, the Seattle Times did a story about the Snake River runs talking about how they had collapsed. But the, one of the things that I noticed is, is that they stopped their graphic at the year 2019. Why did they do that earlier this year? 2020 data were available. Well, because 2020 data went up, the runs went increased. So they, ha they just happened to end their data on the worst year and ignored data that were available showing that it had turned around. So that's a very frustrating thing that happens that is just unscientific and it's bad for the environment because it leads us to put money where it's not needed. Right. In, in Puget Sound, salmon are not recovering. They are in the Snake River. And yet what we're getting told is we should put all of our money in the snake and we're underfunding Puget Sound. I want to remind everybody if you enjoyed today's program uh, to be sure to share WashingtonPolicy.org with your friends and family and, um, and like thinkers. Um, if you know people who are challenged who uh, would like to read about um, challenging policy and uh, people who like free markets um, and like to have their, or people who like to have their point of view challenged uh, go to WashingtonPolicy.org. Our blog is right on the homepage. Our publications are there, freely available to the public. We rely on member support in order to stay uh, stay in business and to keep you informed and to keep Washington State uh, moving toward uh, greater free markets. So please uh, consider joining Washington Policy Center. I shared a link in the chat function so that you can see the different levels of support and, uh, and you can share those with your friends uh, and family as well. Um, so I'd encourage you to do that. We have, uh, I just want to do one more question because this one has been outstanding. It's a very quick answer. And then we'll close the program. Uh, Mark, does the written assertion that's required by uh, LNI and given to LNI by employers, does it require the inclusion of personal health information of employees? Does this uh, personal health information include names of employees themselves? Yeah, the rules require an employer to record the name of the employee and the assestation that they've gone through, whether vaccinated or vaccinated, or if they've declined to, to state that. Arguably, that's health data, um, but that doesn't require them. And specifically, Illinois has said that you don't need to have copies of their vaccine cards or um, other medical documentation, just, just the actual assestation. You can, however, if and they recommend this, if you're not vaccinated, they want to put a badge on you, on your employee badge, so you can see at at 30 feet that you've been vaccinated or not. And I'm sorry, that's that's just too, no, that's outrageous. So that's the answer. All right, thanks, Mark. Thank you, Todd. Thank you, Mark, uh, both of you. And uh, thanks to the Washington Policy Center staff on the back end, uh, helping us out with this uh, program. We do um, Washington Policy on the go. We're uh, doing it as a monthly event. So uh, look forward to us next month. I think it's the second Tuesday of the month. You can uh, check out our events page at WashingtonPolicy.org. You can also see uh, our first announced speaker for our annual dinner, the CEO of Whole Foods, John Mackey, who has a, a specific um, and a special passion for free markets. He will be one of our keynote speakers at our Bellevue event. Uh, and you can read about that at our annual dinner page. Just go to the events page at WashingtonPolicy.org and, and get ready for that. Those, uh, those events do sell out very early. So if you're interested, uh, make sure that you, you uh, make those plans accordingly. 
Um, thanks again, and we'll see you next month. Uh, we'll have this presentation up on our YouTube channel uh, for you to share uh, if you have uh, any friends who want to see the whole presentation. Thank you.